In this video, we're going to take a look at using activity-based cost management as a means to add value to a firm. In particular, we're going to look at activity-based cost management to evaluate customers as well as suppliers. If you recall, activity-based costing is a system used to assign cost to products based on a product's use of activities, which are the discrete task an organization undertakes to make or deliver a particular product. Activity-based costing focused on factory work or the production of our product. Activity-based management is going to focus on the non-factory side of our business. And the goal of activity-based management will be to focus on managing activities to reduce our costs and improve profitability. Let's begin by considering how customers affect our profitability and using activity-based uh, management to evaluate our customers. The underlying concept is that customers, as well as suppliers, use resources. And some customers, as well as suppliers, use more resources than others. Think about the last time you stood in line to purchase a ticket, check in for a flight, or make a transaction at a bank. Many people ahead of you are purchasing the same ticket, service, flight, deposit, but some take longer, sometimes much longer, to complete the transaction. The additional time that customers take add cost to our company. We will use the same four steps in activity-based costing to assess both our customers as well as suppliers. Recall our first step is to identify the activities that consume resources. Step two, identify a cost driver associated with each activity. Step three, compute a cost or activity rate uh, for each unit of our transaction that we're concerned about. And then step four is assign cost to customers by multiplying our cost driver by the volume of the cost driver units consumed by a particular activity or a transaction. We're going to consider operating data for Red's Lumber, in particular two customers, Jack and Jill. The cost flow or the service that we're providing to our customers is the delivery of lumber. Our workflow involves entering an order, picking an order, and then finally delivering an order. Our two hypothetical customers, Jack and Jill, both make the same level of purchases, $50,000 a year, and the cost of filling those from a cost of goods sold perspective is $30,000, leaving a gross margin of $20,000 for both. We're currently allocating delivery charges as 16% of revenues. 16% of the $50,000 is $8,000 for both Jack and for Jill. Both customers look equally as profitable. But as you might suspect, that measure of profitability will change if we implement an activity-based costing to the evaluation of our customers. Again, step one, identify the activities. Our order process flow is entering orders, picking orders, and delivering orders. So we've identified three activities. And we assign each a cost driver, or identify a cost driver, for each activity. For orders, it's the number of orders entered. For picking orders, it's the number of items picked. For delivering orders, it's the number of deliveries we make. And then we have a catch-all performing general administrative cost, and we're going to base that based on the order value. So we've identified activities, identified cost drivers. The last step is to, or next step is to compute a cost or activity rate for each driver and cost pool. For entering orders, we again Take the cost pool, $100,000, divide it by the cost driver, which was the number of orders, and we get $10 per order. For picking orders, we take the $150,000 cost pool, divide by 75,000 items that we're picking, and we get $2 per item, and we continue. Notice that we're allocating the entire $800,000 of cost using activity-based cost management and four cost drivers rather than a single cost driver, which was simply a percentage of sales, which is what we showed on our exhibit earlier, the 800,000, and it was allocated simply as a percentage of total sales. Once we've calculated the activity rates, we're going to apply those to the various levels of activities for both customers. One of the things we notice right away is that Jack places a far higher number of orders to arrive at $50,000 of sales and that requires a greater number of deliveries. So we're going to find that Jack is a more costly customer than Jill. 
So we take our cost drivers up top, and we're going to take our cost drivers and multiply them by the activity levels for Jack, and then we will do the same thing for Jill. We take the $10 per order times 150 orders for Jack, and we get $1,500. We take the $2 per item, multiply it by 750 items. We take $200 per delivery, multiply by 24 deliveries, and finally the 5% of the 50,000 order value. We get a total cost of servicing jack of $10,300. We make the same calculations for Jill, again taking the cost drivers, multiplying by Jill's activity level, and we find a total cost of servicing Jill of $5,700. And we see our cost of calcul our calculated cost of servicing Jack is higher than that of Jill and higher than our original expectation using a percentage of revenues approach. We can do one of two things about this. We can drop Jack as a customer, but that doesn't make much sense. Probably the best idea is to go back and talk to Jack as a customer and suggest that he make larger, less frequent orders. This is one of the reasons we see many online retailers imposing a minimum order size for free shipping. You have to say spend $50 or $75 to um, have free shipping on an order. They're trying to encourage larger, less frequent ordering. Now we're going to use a similar analysis to evaluate the cost of suppliers. We're given information on annual data on lumber deliveries to Red Lumbers from two different mills, Pacific Mills and Coastal Lumber. We've purchased more board feet from Pacific Mills than Coastal Lumber at a slightly lower average cost per board foot. We're given information on the total number of deliveries and the percentage of late deliveries. And one of the things we notice is that Pacific Mills has a lower cost per board foot, but a higher percentage of late deliveries. And this can translate into problems with our customers. It can lead to reduced customer satisfaction if deliveries are late, or perhaps penalties if we don't get lumber to construction job sites on the promised or scheduled due dates. We've been received recent bids from both Pacific Mills and Coastal Lumber for $2.04 per board foot from Pacific Mills and $2.07 per board foot from Coastal Lumber. So notice the spread between prices has increased from one cent to three cents. But now let's go ahead and evaluate the cost of buying from each supplier after we take into account the probability of late delivery. Again, probability of late delivery for Pacific Mills was 50%, and for Coastal Lumber it was 10%. So let's put that down here. We are given, or told rather, that the cost of late delivery is 10 cents per board foot. Let's go ahead and figure out the expected cost of late delivery. The expected cost is simply the probability of a late delivery times the cost per late delivery. So we have the expected cost per late delivery for Pacific Mills of five cents per board foot. And for the coastal lumber, it's only one cent per board foot. So we can see our total expected cost from Pacific Mills is $2.09, and it's only $2.08 from Coastal Lumber. We could extend this analysis further and evaluate the cost of receiving the lumber from each provider. One of the providers might have on-time deliveries early in the morning when we're less busy. The other one might have on-time deliveries, but later in the afternoon while we are quite busy. Um, the lumber might be bundled differently so we could consider other costs associated with buying the lumber other than just the expected cost of late deliveries. We could have quality costs that we would want to evaluate or consider as well. The last segment of this worksheet is using 
uh, and supplying resources and evaluating the cost of unused capacity. Unused capacity is the difference between the resources that are used and the resources that are supplied. And depending on how we calculate our activity rates, we can have misleading reports and not fully understand the amount of excess capacity we have. For instance, here's a traditional financial statement for res lumber. Notice all we have is total delivery cost of $800,000. It doesn't talk about the excess capacity we might have in any one of these particular categories. Do we have extra room on our trucks? Do we have receiving and delivery personnel standing idle at various times? In this exercise, we're going to look at how we can break this $800,000 down into resources used versus resources supplied. It's really very straightforward. We're going to take the $800,000 and simply break it down. Here's our same income statement, but broken down into the categories of used versus supplied, and that allows us to calculate unused capacity. Recall when we calculated our cost driver rates earlier, we used our actual capacity in calculating our activity rates, 10,000, 75,000, 12,500. And that gave us our cost drivers, which we applied using actual levels of activity. That's what's calculated in this column here, the used column. This would have been our cost driver rates multiplied by the actual level of activity for number of orders, number of items, and numbers of deliveries. The difference between these two columns is simply our unused capacity. So we have the capacity to fill an additional 3,500 orders during the year. We have the capacity to deliver an additional 7,500 items and the capacity to make an additional 4,167 deliveries. And the cost of those items is simply our $100,000 in cost minus our order related cost assigned to particular customers. And we can come up with a total for the amount of unused capacity related to deliveries. $150,000 per year. We were given our other operating costs and of course our net operating income then is simply our gross margin plus the delivery fees we charge to customers because recall we're charging them as a percentage of revenues and that was 16% of revenues minus our delivery costs as well as our other operating costs. The big lesson is how can we think about either reducing these costs or assigning these costs specifically to customers to improve our bottom line?